in her eyes. We withdrew the children from school and then took the train to Toronto. The young family arrived at the mission home at 133 Lyndhurst Avenue and immediately embarked on a tour of the very large mission. Then we realized, Tom said, that all the responsibility of presiding over the entire Canadian mission now was squarely upon our shoulders. He looked younger than half the missionaries in the field. Uh, he was thin and very athletic. He played basketball. He'd play basketball with the elders. And we sensed in him a kind of a green missionary, someone who not that we'd ever think of taking advantage of him, but we thought, well, we have had six months on this mission president, and there's some here that have been out two years. And we thought we could maybe uh, teach him. We were dead wrong. On October 1st, 1959, Francis gave birth to their third child, Clark Spencer Monson. President Monson recalls, it was nice for the missionaries to have a new baby in the mission home. It seemed to bring a touch of their own families closer to them. 133 Lyndhurst Avenue was a busy place to raise a growing family. With missionaries coming and going, the Monson family rarely had dinner alone. Each night when it was about my bedtime, he would invite me into his office, or I would knock on the door and go into his office. And he would pull out a checkerboard that he kept in one drawer, and lay it out on his desk and I would sit by his desk and we would play checkers for 10 or 15 minutes and that was something that was my time only with him and that I appreciated very much. Spurred on by their young mission president, the missionaries began to be more productive. Convert baptisms increased. The building program gained momentum. I was pleased with our progress, President Monson said. An attitude of success permeated the mission. In August 1960, Elder Marquis e. Peterson of the Quorum of the Twelve came to Toronto to organize the Toronto Stake, the 300th Stake of the Church. The general sessions of this special stake conference were held in Toronto's Odeon Carlton Theatre. Every one of the 2,249 seats were filled, with the largest percentage of members in attendance at a state conference anywhere in the church. I remember there was lots of excitement in the mission because it was the first stake that was organized in eastern Canada. And he announced that day who were to be the different leaders. And when he got up and announced that I was to be the primary, the state primary president, I was a little bit shocked because I'd never heard about it. So, so when we met after, he said, I knew you'd say yes. And it was just thrilling for us as missionaries to be there and to know that we are finally a stake of the church. After three years of labor, President Monson received a letter of honorable release from the First Presidency. As we departed Toronto, we left a little of our hearts in this beautiful city. But memories, ever dear, have been retained. Shortly after returning to Salt Lake City, Tom was named general manager of the Deseret Press. He was now responsible for the largest printing plant west of the Mississippi. On Thursday afternoon, October 3rd, 1963, Tom was working at his office when a call came from Claire Middlemiss, secretary to President David O. McKay. After coming on the line and exchanging pleasantries, President McKay said, Brother Monson, could you visit with me sometime? After a positive response, President McKay said, Could you come to the office now? Placing everything aside, Tom drove to church headquarters where he was ushered into the office of President McKay. He had me sit next to him on a chair at the side of his desk. Then with great emotion, he said, Brother Monson, with the passing of President Henry D. Moyle, I've named Elder Nathan Eldon Tanner to be my second counselor in the First Presidency. The Lord has called you to fill his place in the Council of the Twelve Apostles. Could you accept that calling? I was overcome. 
finally assured him I could. He then welcomed me to the ranks of the general authorities and indicated this would be a most rewarding experience and one where my talents and energies would be used to the maximum. Many instructed me that I should tell no one except my wife and inform me that I would be sustained at the Friday morning session of conference the very next day. Returning home, Tom felt little like eating dinner. He told Francis he had some printing proofs to deliver and asked if she would like to come with him. They drove to the east bench of Salt Lake City and parked adjacent to This Is The Place Monument. Together, they walked around the monument, reading the inscriptions and pondering the pioneers and their heritage. As they returned to the car, Francis said, What's wrong? You have something on your mind. He then revealed to her the sacred nature of his call. That night, neither of us slept very well, Tom said. My feet were like ice. The next morning, at General Conference, Tom made his way toward members of the Priesthood Home Teaching Committee. As he was about to sit next to Hugh Smith, Hugh said, You don't want to sit there. Twice before, the men sitting next to me were called to be general authorities. Tom took his seat regardless. It is now proposed that we sustain the following. As members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Joseph Fielding Smith, Howard W. Hunter, Gordon B. Hinckley, and Thomas S. Monson. An astonished Hugh Smith whispered, Lightning has struck a third time. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. I am grateful for the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior, when he said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. I earnestly pray, my brothers and sisters, that my life might merit this promise from our Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The following week, at a special meeting of the First Presidency and Council of the Twelve in the Salt Lake Temple, Thomas S. Monson was ordained an apostle and set apart as a member of the Council of the Twelve. Elder Monson said, It was one of the most dramatic days of my life. Major responsibilities came almost immediately. He was named as chairman of the Adult Correlation Committee, as advisor to the young men and young women's organizations, chairman of the Church Leadership Committee, and area supervisor for missionary work in the Western United States. In 1965, assignments among the Twelve were rotated, and Elder Monson was assigned to supervise the missions of the South Pacific, including Australia, New Zealand, and the islands of Polynesia. During his first visit to Samoa, he visited the small village of Saniatu and spoke at the church school to a large gathering of small children. As the closing hymn was announced, Elder Monson suddenly felt compelled to personally greet each of the 247 children. Checking the clock, he saw that time was too short and discounted the impression. Then, just prior to the closing prayer, he again felt a strong impression to shake the hand of each child. Upon communicating this desire, both the instructor and children were overcome with joy. The instructor then revealed the reason for their relation. He said when they learned a member of the Twelve was coming, he told the children if each would earnestly pray and exert great faith, the Apostle would be impressed to greet each child with a personal hand clasp. Tears could not be restrained, Elder Monson said, as each of these precious children walked past and whispered a sweet Talovalava. The people of the Pacific Islands have such great faith 
One occasion I accompanied President Hubert.